All right, everyone, welcome to our second lecture of cellular division. So last uh, lecture, we went through mitosis, and that's really how general cells are going to grow and divide and repair. Um, some cells undergo mitosis and some don't, right? So we talked about that, but now we're really gonna get into a very specific um, type of cellular division, and that's meiosis, and only um, our gametes, our sexual reproductive cells, are going to undergo um, meiosis, okay? All right, so what are we going to be talking about today? We are going to cover sexual reproduction. So just a little review on um, eukaryotic cells versus prokaryotic cells and sexual reproduction versus asexual reproduction and why there are some advantages and disadvantages to both. And then we're really gonna get into meiosis. What is meiosis? What happens, right? And uh, the first step is really a very similar to mitosis. So we've already kind of covered part of it and then we're gonna get into the rest of it. And also what happens when things go wrong in meiosis. So we talked a little bit about uh, cancer with mitosis and essentially it's just, you know, uncontrolled division. So there are certain errors that can happen during meiosis um, and these are some chromosomal errors that we can now test for uh, during early pregnancies, okay? So sexual reproduction is really an early eukaryotic evolutionary innovation. So most cells just underwent um, mitosis or essentially asexual reproduction. They're just making copies of themselves, right? Exact copies. But what this does is it actually creates um, a different um, possibility, right? So the dominant form of reproduction in multicellular organisms is sexual reproduction. And so there is some success uh, for this because of the randomization uh, for these different traits. You know, not your kid doesn't look exactly like you. So essentially you're going to um, have variation in the future uh, generations, which means that that organism can adapt, right? So we can get variation, we get mutation, and therefore um, we have the possibility of success, right? So that's why it really became the dominant form of reproduction, okay? So if we just review a little bit about asexual reproduction, and this is really uh, fission or binary fission. We already kind of talked about this uh, with the prokaryotic cells, um, and it does have some advantages over sexual reproduction. It doesn't require the opposite sex, right? So asexual reproduction, one cell becomes two identical daughter cells, right? Um, you have you can put more energy into making more identical copies of yourself right so it takes more energy to undergo sexual reproduction uh, so this takes a lot less energy so you can make a lot more um, copies of yourself okay if you were to have a successful trait you will continue that to your offspring. Whereas in sexual reproduction, that trait may or may not pass to the offspring because of that chance of variation, okay? So I've just really answered that question already. Why does sexual reproduction have an evolutionary advantage? Well, it has to do with that genetic variation. Right? So it's important for the survival and reproduction of the offspring if you're going to pass on these variations and potential you know, for survival and adaptation in the future. So this is why sexual reproduction is really the dominant uh, form of reproduction in multicellular organisms because we have this great evolutionary advantage. And so this process is called meiosis. 
So there's this whole interesting theory that actually, you know, came out of Alice in Wonderland, and that's the Red Queen hypothesis. And essentially it just states that you need ongoing variation uh, for the survival of a species. So essentially the quote from Alice in Wonderland is it takes all the running you can do to stay in the same place. So essentially we have not only um, variation within individuals, but those variations are going to interact with other individuals as well as the environment. And this is all called coevolution, and we'll see this when we talk about um, evolution and these relationships that uh, predators and prey have, parasites and hosts, uh, flowers and pollinators. So there's um, a lot of relationship between all of these um, organisms in the environment and so essentially you need variation to essentially survive because your environment is um, evolving, um, the other organisms in your environment are, are evolving and so um, that's the basis of this Red Queen hypothesis which is just kind of interesting that it comes from Alice in Wonderland. So what is meiosis, right? So meiosis is the process of two divisions. So instead of just dividing once, like we do in mitosis, we copy everything and then we divide it. What we're gonna actually do is divide twice. So we're gonna only end up with half the number of chromosomes in each gamete. So instead of getting two daughter cells, you're gonna get four gametes that are going to be haploid. That means they only have half of the genetic material, okay? And that's why they need another gamete uh, to sexually reproduce and become an actual organism. And the idea of variation actually is introduced qu quite a lot, not only during meiosis, but also again at fertilization. So we actually have two episodes of variation during meiosis, and we'll talk about that. And then again at fertilization as well, right? Because, you know, it's just the random egg with the random sperm and whatever half, you know, chromosomes those guys have, that's what's going to end up being um, that organism. So it's kind of interesting, you know, it's really a, a draw out of a hat, right? So lots of variation um, is being introduced during this process. So once we have our gametes, which are our haploid cells, fertilization is the term for the union of the two gametes. So you have a sperm and an egg, which are both haploid cells, and they essentially have to combine uh, to result in a diploid cell. And that diploid cell is called a zygote, right? So our gametes combine to form a zygote. So now we have um, all the chromosomes that we need to be able to start uh, dividing and growing and becoming um, an organism. So meiosis is very similar to mitosis. Um, the very first few steps are very similar, uh, but instead of you know ending up with two diploid cells, you're going to end up with four haploid cells. So essentially, we're going to reduce the number of chromosomes. First, we're going to duplicate our chromosomes, just like we do in mitosis. And then inst instead of just one round of nuclear division, we actually have two rounds of nuclear division. Okay, so we just add an extra step essentially in meiosis, but it's a very important step. Um, and during this whole process, we do get some of that variation we talked about. So um, we'll go through those specifics here in a minute. So let's go through these phases of meiosis. So the first phase is interphase, and that is identical to the cell cycle, which is what we just covered in the last lecture. So that is great. That helps us out a ton. And now we're going to undergo those two rounds of division. Okay. So we start off with our diploid parent cell. We undergo one round of division, which is meiosis one. And essentially we separate those homologous chromosomes, right? So we said chromosomes are paired up. They're homologous, meaning they match each other. And we're going to divide them. OK, 
Okay, we're going to separate them. Now they still have their sister chromatids with them, right? It's because we've uh, undergone uh, interphase, we've done DNA replication, so we now have our sister chromatids, but we're going to separate those homologous chromosomes in meiosis 1. Okay, so we actually do have now two haploid daughter cells, right? Because we've halved, if you, you don't pay attention to the sister chromatid really, but you say, okay, I've separated our chromosomes, we have half the amount of DNA, okay? Now we're undergoing meiosis two. So now we have to separate those sister chromatids apart, okay? Now we still have haploid gametes, but we have four of them because each daughter cell is going to undergo meiosis two, okay? So we only have one meiosis one, but we actually have two cells undergoing meiosis two, which is how we get four gametes, okay? So we'll go through this in a little more detail as well, but this is just to give you a good overview of what's happening during meiosis. So here's another image. I know it's a little blurry, uh, but I do have a link to a video and it will be on Canvas as well uh, with um, our little cartoon that kind of helps to explain the process of meiosis. So up here we have uh, interphase at the top, and then we line up our meiosis one and meiosis two. And again, we're going through the similar stages of mitosis. We still have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, right? So we still have those phases because we are undergoing cell division. But a certain things are gonna happen that are a little bit different in meiosis compared to mitosis, okay? So remember we said meiosis one, we're splitting those homologous chromosomes apart, right? They still have their little sister chromatid attached, right? So we end up with our two haploid daughter cells. And we take those two haploid daughter cells and they are gonna undergo meiosis two. And this is where we split up those sister chromatids, okay? And then we get our four haploid daughter cells. So go ahead and check out the video as well, and hopefully um, you can watch it maybe after watching this or before or right now, and hopefully that'll help uh, solidify a little bit about what's going on with some animation. So let's review a little bit what happens during interphase. We said we do some growing, right? So cell growth, some energy. We replicate our DNA and we now prepare for meiosis instead of mitosis, okay? So essentially we're replacing mitosis in the cell cycle with meiosis one and two, okay? Our two divisions. So essentially that one set of homologous chromosomes becomes two sets of sister chromatids, right? So this is our same image from before when we were talking about DNA replication during mitosis. So our homologous chromosomes, they stay the same and we replicate each chromosome to get us our sister chromatids, okay? So that's what's happening during replication. So same DNA synthesis process, same interphase, same checkpoints, all of that good stuff that we talked about during mitosis, except now these cells are gonna undergo two rounds of division with meiosis. So let's review just a little bit. So after replication, a human cell contains how many chromosomes? How many homologous chromosome pairs? And how many sister chromatids, right? So how many chromosomes does a human cell have, right? We said 46 chromosomes. So if those are pairs, we have 23 homologous chromosome pairs, right? Now, if we're talking about the sister chromatids, we're going to copy each of those chromosomes, right? Each of those chromosome pairs. So now we're gonna have 46 sister chromatids, right? So 
if we have a pair of homologous chromosomes, that's two chromosomes, but we have four sister chromatids, right? So if we look at our little picture. So that means we have 46 chromosomes, 23 homologous pairs, and 46 sister chromatids, okay? So again, let's take a little bit of time, maybe pause the video, and kind of figure out what's the difference between a homologous pair of chromosomes and sister chromatids, okay? So there's one kind of major difference. All right, so what did we say that homologous pairs have in common? So they have the same genes in the same locus, right, in the same spot, but it could be a different trait, right? We talked about our hair color and our, hot, and our eye color. So one chromosome could say blue eyes and one could say brown eyes, right? But that's still the same gene for eye color in the same spot on the chromosome. So those are homologous chromosomes. They're similar, right? So they're similar. They line up with their genes in the locus. But the difference is the sister chromatids are identical copies of that chromosome. Okay, so they are identical. They're sister chromatids, they're, they're twins, right? So they are identical, whereas homologous chromosome pairs are not identical, but they are very similar. Their genes and locus line up, right? But they may, um, they may have a different trait. Right, so they may have a blue eyes versus brown eyes, okay? So now let's go through meiosis one in a little bit more detail. So this is where we're actually separating those homologous chromosomes, but our sister chromatids are staying intact, right? So our identical twins are staying attached. We're just separating the homologous pair. So two major variation events occur during meiosis one. So this is where we get a lot of genetic variation. And those two events are called crossing over an independent assortment. And we're gonna go through those um, in more detail. But the, the idea is that we're separating our homologous pairs of chromosomes, but the sister chromatids stay attached. So our picture just kind of goes through our pro metaphase, uh, our pro phase one, metaphase one, and anaphase one. So essentially, we're getting this crossing over event happening during pro phase. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a minute. And this has to do with our sister chromatids. Okay, and then we're going to line up just like we talked about before in metaphase. And this is where our independent assortment happens. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a minute. And then we pull those homologous chromosomes apart in anaphase. Okay, but again, we still have our sister chromatids attached. Okay, so then we end up with our two uh, daughter cells that are haploid. Okay, because they only have one chromosome each, right? So we've split the chromosomes, so we have just one of the pair, okay? So let's go through these special events that uh, cause genetic variation, okay? So the first one is that these homologous chromosomes are really closely paired up, so they're kind of smashed right next to each other, and they still have their sister chromatids attached, right? So there's four sister chromatids, two chromosomes, all smashed up together. And essentially we call this a synapsis, where there's this tight pairing of these homologous chromosomes. And essentially if you think of these uh, little things like arms or legs, little um, chromosomes, and essentially what happens is they touch and essentially they can swap 
genes, okay? And this process is called crossing over. Okay, so if you look at our picture, essentially see the synapses is where the red and the blue kind of come together and touch, right? And then you're going to swap essentially the DNA at those two locations at the ends of those arms or legs of the chromosomes. Okay, so you're actually kind of swapping DNA and now we no longer have an identical sister chromatid. We've actually swapped some DNA with the other chromosome. Okay, ooh, that's kind of cool. So we get some chance of variation, right? They're no longer identical. Okay. So now I've just written out that crossing over is the exchange of a chromosome segment between non-sister homologous chromatids, right? So they're, the two sister chromatids are identical, but one of the sister chromatids is actually going to exchange genetic material with that other sister chromatid of the homologous set, okay? So I think this is another great picture to explain it a little bit more because only those inside uh, sister chromatids are going to cross over. Right? So they have a, an event where they actually cross over, they're going to exchange that genetic information, and now we've changed uh, the sister chromatid, and we call them um, recombinant chromatids. Okay, And the ones on the outsides are called non-recombinant chromatids. But don't worry too much about the names, just know what the crossing over event is right so we're exchanging genetic material between these non-sister homologous chromatids okay so now the sister chromatids are no longer identical right so again reproduce these recombinant chromatids that just means it has different genetic material okay all right, so now that we know what crossing over is, that's our first major variation event during prophase one. Now we actually have another opportunity for variation during metaphase one. So this is where we line up all of our homologous chromosomes in the center and we're gonna eventually separate them. So we know that the homologous chromosomes are obviously paired up, right? But, the difference is, is you can actually arrange them in two different ways. So think of it kind of like they can be on the left or the right. Okay, you're still going to always pair the same chromosome, you know, pairs. They're always going to be paired together because they're similar and they have their uh, sister chromatids with them. But we can either be on the left or the right. And that's called independent assortment. So it's this equal probability of these two different arrangements, which will then affect our metaphase two uh, during meiosis two. So let's look at our example and hopefully it becomes a little more clear. Okay, so essentially in probability or possibility A, we have all of our blue chromosomes on one side and our red chromosomes on the other side. So obviously the long chromosomes are always going to pair up and the short chromosomes are always going to pair up. But in this case, we have the blues on the left and the reds on the right, which gives us, if once they separate, only blues on the left and only reds on the right. But what happens if we swap one of those pairs, right? So that's possibility B. So we've kept blue on the left and red on the right with our long chromosomes, but now our short chromosomes have swapped, right? So now our red is on the left and blue is on the right. Again, we're still pairing the same chromosomes, but they've swapped positions on where they are on the lineup. So now if we separate them, we have a mix, right? So we have a long blue and a short red on the left, and a long red and a short blue on the right, okay? Which is going to give us all of these different combinations down at the bottom, right? So our gametes have four different possible combinations. So that's called independent assortment. When we line up our homologous chromosomes, we can swap them, 
left or right, right? So we can swap them in two different ways. So just to reiterate what's happening at the end or during meiosis one, our homologous chromosomes separate. We've got crossover events and independent assortment, which can cause our variation. Those sister chromatids stay attached, right? So our now recombinant and non-recombinant chromatids, right? So now we've swapped some of that DNA with the recombinant chromatids during our crossover event. And we have some independent assortment as well. And now we've separated them. Okay, so now we have our two haploid uh, daughter cells, okay? So now we are able to undergo our second division and that's meiosis two. Now this is very similar to mitosis, okay? But we have half the number of chromosomes to start because we've already halved our number in meiosis one. Okay, so in this one, we're actually separating the sister chromatids now. Okay, so we have the same stages again, our prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. But what we have is half the number of chromosomes. We are now lining up just the sister chromatids, right? And we're gonna separate those sister chromatids. So we're gonna continue with only the half the number of chromosomes because we don't really count the sister chromatid <clears throat> as a chromosome, right? So now we've separated our sister chromatids and we have four haploid daughter cells. So we talked about crossing over and independent assortment as being our two chances of variation during meiosis one. And then we also have the chance of uh, variation in fertilization as well. And so these three big chances of variation cause a lot of differences in our population, right? So if you actually look at it and you look at those four uh, gametes that you're producing, each one is distinctly different. Right? You have four genetically distinct chromosomes at the end of meiosis one and two because of all of this crossover and independent assortment. Right? So that just gives you a huge possibility of variation, um, especially then during fertilization. Right? So which sperm is going to fertilize that egg? Um, so the chances are vast. Right? which is great, right? This leads to a lot of uh, genetic variation and, poten and potential for success. So let's put this variation um, to an example. So this is just gonna be an example of our different traits that could be on a pair of homologous chromosomes. So we said that homologous chromosomes share the same genes for the same trait, but you may have a different trait, right? So here's our example of our pair of homologous chromosomes and they have their sister chromatids, right? So we have each pair of sister chromatids right here, okay? So we have a crossover event right here happening between those two non-homologous sister chromatids. And what happens is, is they're gonna swap that genetic material creating four different gametes. So if we look at our traits, our top set is for hair color, okay? So our first chromosome has brown hair and our other homologous chromosome has blonde hair, okay? And then our second trait here okay, is going to be finger length, okay? Now, both chromosomes have the same trait. They're all long fingers, but we could have short fingers in there, right? And then our last trait is going to be hair texture, right? Whether we're curly, if we're on one chromosome or if we're straight on the other. Now, if we look at our traits after we have undergone meiosis, okay? So if you look, so each one of these sister chromatids is going to be a gamete, okay? So let's call um, number one here, okay? So that's number one. 
So that's going to be independent of the other ones once we have finished our uh, meiosis. So we're going to have brown hair, long fingers, and curly hair, right? Now what happened in number two? We underwent a crossover event, right? So now we've swapped straight hair for curly hair. So we have brown eyes, long fingers, but now we have straight hair instead of curly hair. So we've swapped. Same with number three. That one also underwent crossover, so it's a recombinant chromatid. So we have now blonde hair, long fingers, and curly hair instead of straight hair, because we've swapped, right? And then last, our fourth gamete, which is our fourth chromatid, we have blonde hair, long fingers, and straight hair. So that's four different possibilities, right? None are the same, which is really kind of interesting. So that means you've created four eggs or four sperm that are completely different from each other, okay? And that's all due to our crossing over independent assortment, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about random fertilization. It plays a huge part in our variation because two of those, you know, many different um, possibilities of gametes will lead to a diploid cell or a zygote. And that means there are trillions of possible outcomes, right? That's just crazy to think about, okay? So, it's just random chance essentially. And that's how, you know, that's why some kids look a little more like their parents or you have a really good blend of parents or they don't look like either parent. You're like, where did the heck did that kid come from, right? Um, and so it's just random chance, which is crazy to think about. So I like this picture because it uh, shows you the differences between mitosis and meiosis. I know they can be quite confusing, especially when you're trying to compare them side to side, what's similar and what's different. So we said that the early phases, the interphase is all exactly the same, right? So that's gonna be great during the cell cycle. And essentially we're just replacing mitosis with meiosis during this lecture. So meiosis one is really the big different game changer uh, during meiosis, right? That's where we're getting our crossover events. We're getting our independent assortment. Um, we're having the amount of chromosomes. So that's really where all the action is happening, okay? And that has no similarities to mitosis. Okay. But then once we get into meiosis two, now that's very similar to mitosis, except we have half the amount of chromosomes in meiosis. So we're splitting sister chromatids instead of um, chromosomes themselves. Okay. So that's the difference. That's the difference between uh, meiosis two and mitosis. Okay. So with meiosis, we get four haploid cells or gametes. And then in mitosis, you're getting two diploid cells that are identical to the starting cell, right? So a lot of genetic variation in meiosis, but no genetic variation in mitosis. So here's just a table to kind of write out these uh, similarities and differences between mitosis and meiosis. So I kind of talked through them, but this will lay it out for you so that it hopefully will, will become very clear. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can answer these uh, yourself and then we'll go through uh, the answers together. All right, so on the final chromosome count, mitosis versus meiosis, do we have the same amount of chromosomes or half the amount of chromosomes? So mitosis, we have the same, right? 
And then during meiosis, we are having the amount of chromosomes. Okay. And then how many divisions do we undergo? Well, in mitosis, we're only doing one division, but meiosis, we're doing two divisions. And then how many cells do we get? We get two cells from mitosis, and we get four cells from meiosis. Now, are these new cells genetically identical or different to the parent cell? They are identical in mitosis, but they are different in meiosis, right? That's where we get that genetic variation. So here are our answers, right? So we just went through them, but to make sure you got them right here. So what can go wrong in meiosis? And again, these are these, um, you know, chromosomal defects, they call them, um, you know, that can happen and that we test for during early pregnancies. So it can result in either meiosis one or two. And what happens is we can alter the number of chromosomes that end up in the gametes. So we should have half the amount of chromosomes, but maybe we get all the chromosomes or a third of the chromosomes. So there's what's called non-disjunction. So this occurs if we fail to separate those homologous chromosomes or the sister chromatids during uh, meiosis one or two. Right, so during metaphase, they're supposed to line up and then we separate them during anaphase, but what happens if we don't separate them? That's non-disjunction. So both chromosomes or both chromatids go to one cell and none go to the other, right? So you may have, you know, extra chromosomes in one cell and less than the amount in another in another cell, right? So that's non-disjunction. So then your gametes end up with the wrong number of chromosomes. So here's another picture of non-disjunction to show you how it can happen uh, during meiosis in the first image or during meiosis two in the second image, okay? So if it happens during meiosis one, that's where the homologous chromosomes are supposed to separate. So if we don't uh, separate one, then we're gonna get you know, N plus one, so an extra chromosome in two of our gametes, and then an N minus one or missing a chromosome in the other two gametes, okay? And then if it happens during meiosis two, when we separate our sister chromatids, we could get a variation of things. We could get an N plus one, where you get an extra chromosome. We could do N minus one, right, where you're missing a chromosome, or you could have then two um, normal amounts of chromosomes as well. So it's not as detrimental if it happens during meiosis two because you're only messing up two of your four, that's still half, versus meiosis one, you're messing up all four of them, okay? So neither one is good, but this just shows you kind of the difference if it happens during meiosis one or two. So one common example of an error in meiosis or non-disjunction is Down syndrome. Uh, it's also called trisomy 21 because it's due to an extra copy of chromosome 21. And essentially what happens with Down syndrome is uh, the person does not live as long, has a lot more uh, medical problems, um, they have some different facial features, um, they have irregular teeth, some heart defects, so they really, um, it just varies on the uh, disabilities, they usually have a shorter lifespan as well. And so the risk for Down syndrome does increase with maternal age, but nowadays the testing is so good uh, for Down syndrome that we're seeing less and less occurrence of Down syndrome.
So here are some other examples um, of um, non-disjunction in the sex chromosome. Okay, so um, we do get some abnormal sex chromosomes and they test for this as well when you get tested for uh, Down syndrome. So essentially some of these you have either an extra X chromosome or an extra Y chromosome um, or you're missing either an X or a Y chromosome in Turner syndrome. So Again, these are, you know, fairly low frequencies in a population, maybe one in 1,000, but they are a possibility, right? And I think why we see um, more disjunction in the sex chromosome is because the chromosomes are not perfectly homologous, especially in the XY chromosome. Right, so you don't need to know all the details of these different syndromes, but it's just an interesting thing to see um, that these are a possibility, right? So these are errors in meiosis. So this just gives you a little bit of an idea of um, two of our uh, abnormal sex chromosomes. Um, Klinefelter syndrome and Turner syndrome and essentially it just shows you some of the um, symptoms of this of these disorders but you know again you don't need to know the details but it just kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what happens um, to a person with these uh, syndromes so anyways very interesting uh, topic right these chromosomal defects as well as genetic disorders we'll get into a little bit uh, later in the course uh, but if you have any questions this uh, ends our cell division um, hopefully you can watch the videos that'll help out a little bit in comparing uh, mitosis and meiosis so let me know if you have any questions and hopefully I'll see you guys um, in office hours